you know, I broke that teacher thing. Uh, I was telling them every time I've ever taught redemptive gifts, when I get to teacher everybody, and, and I thought, what is this? You know, I've talked to several other redemptive gift teacher people that teach it, and they don't have that trouble, and for some reason I do. And one time I was teaching it, and I had an intercessor station on the front row, and I said, when I get to teach her, start speaking in tongues, just speak in tongues. Well, I looked over, and she was asleep. <laughs> I thought, what in the world? And then I got confused and sleepy, and I thought, well, now I'll take a nap, too, during teacher, and just let it ride. And I, and I haven't figured that out, but I'm going to tell you, Y'all did better than any group I've ever taught teacher to. Some of you got sleepy, but you hung with me. And I thank you for that. I'm going to break that thing off of me because I think it's on me. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's it. That's it. This is a free group. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Uh I hope, I, you know, I write all these things. Don't forget this, and then I don't look at the notes, and that's okay. Just love me anyway. Okay. <laughs> ruler. Okay. Ruler, builder, planner. They want to plan it, build it, guard it, implement it, and father and shepherd it. They are builders, they have a plan. I love my ruler husband, and he's got a plan when he gets up in the morning. I'm telling you, he's got a plan. But it's that plan that keeps us safe. You know, when you're in a chaotic place and a ruler steps into the mix, it feels good because he's got a plan. And he'll pull us together, shepherd us, and help us get out. He's got a plan, and it's usually a good plan. God put rulers in the earth. Their day is day six, the day that God created animals and man. Wow, the sixth day. All of the other was preparation for this day. I have babies, and I love to get the room ready for the baby to come. Well, God does too. I got that from him because he created the whole earth of creation for this day for his kids. He wanted a family. He was given the command to go, take dominion, multiply, and build his kingdom. See, it's right in there that the ruler gets his walking papers through relationship and community. They know how to build because God was in the garden and there was a wilderness and he said to Adam and Eve, see all this around here? See the relationship that we have? Take this and make that look like this. And you know what? He hadn't changed that. He's telling us, make that look like this. We carry kingdom in our hearts. And we're building a kingdom. And he has given us rulers with the anointing to help build, plan it, shepherd it, building community, family. Spiritually, generational blessings are released that day. You see the difference in the plants? Generations, redemptive death. Then on the fifth day, blood and birth came into the earth and a bloodline generation blessing. But on this day, it's a different blessing. It's a spiritual DNA to be released. Generational spiritual blessings on this day. And that hasn't changed either. Here are the characteristics. Get her done. We will just get her done. Nehemiah, Solomon, Joseph, Boaz, they were builder rulers, safe. Get her done. They are God's empire builders. They, the exhorter moves people, but the rulers build empires. Joseph and Solomon, Nehemiah, they were builders. 
They built cities, empires. They call forth the best in people. I've seen my husband. I'll never forget. I just have to tell this little side story. Um, he, he, he built an amazing prayer network in Mississippi back in the 90s. And uh, that was before they were doing a lot of prayer networking. He was one of those pioneers, and he heard the Lord and said, we need a, a network across this state to pray for racial reconciliation in Mississippi and to shift our um, reputation. And so he put together, him and some other pastors put together what he called steering committee. And... Um, he had all these people. I heard their names. I was raising children. I was working as a nurse. Uh, we were still pastoring the church, and so I had plenty to do at home. And I just didn't get what he was getting. He's always kind of gotten it first. He got, he got redemptive gifts first. And then he brought it to me, and I said, yeah, this is me. I took it out of his hands and put it in mine. <laughs> so... I finally admit it. <laughs> Thank you, darling. We'll talk later. <laughs> so he, he has put together this group. We live up in way north Mississippi, and every month he was traveling the whole state of Mississippi, and he would have a meeting in Jackson. He called these people his steering committee, and I was about, what, 10 or 15 of them? I don't know how many you had, and they would meet together once a month. to hear. We didn't have email. We didn't have cell phones. We didn't have all that, and so we had to meet what's happening in your part of the state and together, and then we would send out our newsletter to everybody on the network to say this month pray for we we're going way back so I'd heard about the steering committee and I went talk about some broken weird people <laughs> I said you chose him <laughs> her I mean well, I went with him one time and on the way home I thought where did he find these people? I mean, in, I didn't know anything about intercessors. They were strange people. Strange. <laughs> they didn't look like me. For some reason, I don't think I'm strange. So <laughs> I, I was just amazed. And yet, most of these people had been broken. Most of them had been rejected in their churches. Pastors didn't understand intercessors back then. And uh, they, they had just had so much rejection on them and, and just different. They thought in a different realm. But yet I saw my husband take those broken people and build an amazing network across our state. We had over 1,300, 1,500 people on a monthly mailing list at the post office because those broken people, he believed they could do it. He saw in them something I totally missed because I was looking on the outside. But rulers can look on the inside and they can see past that brokenness just like a prophet perceiver. And they can reach down and say, you would be good at that if you'll walk with us and we'll build. Nehemiah built a wall. Yes, he did in 52 days. Oh, but that wasn't what Nehemiah was building. He was taking broken, exiled people. And he was building a kingdom with living stones. And that's the call of the ruler, is to take those broken stones and to see what they would look like. And he builds the kingdom with those stones. That's the call of a ruler, to build and to plan it, get it done. And boy, do they ever cause others to feel safe. I've got your back. Billy Joe's always got her back. I don't go on canoe trips with Billy Joe any longer because he's going to be the last canoe. How many have been on canoe trips? And how many know those inexperienced ones are going to be turning over in those canoes? 
and somebody's got to pull them out of the water and put them back in the canoe again. Five or six times before you get to the halfway mark. So I don't go canoeing with him because he instinctively brings up the rear, putting people back in the boat, putting people back in the boat. That's his DNA. It irritates me because I'm a mercy and I want to be the first home. I want to be the first one. I want to be in the lead. I want to take it and be the best. But not my husband. And I'm thankful for him because I was certainly broken. They're not in the details. 80% is good enough. That'll do. That'll do. Almost finished, not quite to the end. No welfare mentality. He owns his own problems and he expects you to own your own problems. I did it. I'm sorry, but he doesn't cry over spilt milk. Just clean it up and move on. No guilt. No guilt mentality. And no welfare mentality. I'll work for what I need. I'll find a way to get it. We'll get it done. Very task-oriented. Relationship and loyalty driven if he if not so much Belgium but uh, rulers in general I don't want to keep talking about you honey anyway loyalty driven if they sense that you are not loyal to them they'll walk away now they won't leave everybody in a lurch they'll find someone else to step up and take their place, but they'll walk away if they feel you are not loyal to them. They are loyalty-driven. Always have a plan. Always have a plan. Two key areas for rulers, they are not necessarily nurturers. They're going to shepherd, they're going to herd, they're going to pull you out of the water and put you in the canoe, but they're not going to put a warm blanket around you and say, I'm sorry you fell in that water. They're not going to nurture, but they're going to get you down the river. Not into details. 80% is good enough. What would you say? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no pointy fingers in this group. <laughs> Expecting others to fulfill their agenda because they have a plan they assume everybody else has got the same plan or understands their plan and they think that we're going to all go together and then you get a little exhorter in the mix and she's but I want it to go that way what no that's not the plan but I want to stop up here at this treasure trove place junk place it looks like they have good stuff in there that is not the plan the plan is to get into the car. We will stop at this Lowe's and we will stop at this rest stop and we will get to the destination at this time. Don't mess it up. What did she say? She said you better not be late getting to the car. You got it. Because <laughs> he's sitting there, motor running. That's okay. That's okay. He's got a plan, and he doesn't want anybody messing it. How do I deal with that plan? I tell him this. <sighs> okay. I know that you have a plan today. This is a daily thing, okay? I'm talking daily. You have a plan. Here is my plan. I need to go to Walmart. I need to do this, and I need to do that. And he's fine with that. He just has to back up and make a new plan to include my plan. Because if I didn't tell him that, he would be leaving with the checkbook and I need to go to Walmart and I can't go buy groceries because he's gone. And then I called him and said, but I was going to, you didn't tell me you were going. <sighs> and he makes another plan. Okay. I will meet you at this parking place in Walmart at this time, and he makes another plan. He's got a plan, but he doesn't necessarily 
want to fit into my plan. They've got their agenda. And, and I'm finding it's only taken 50 years to find this. But I have discovered he will include my plan. But for about 45 of those years, I didn't understand that. And I was messing up his plan. And he was never taking into consideration my plan. But we made it, honey, this long. We're going to make it. <laughs> We're going to the finish line. People and resources are devoured because of lack of nurturing. Because they are shepherding, the people are expecting more. And they are giving the 80%, but that 20% is that nurturing that the people are wanting and expecting. They aren't even aware of it. And it's not given. And people become wounded and hurt at a ruler because of that. Because, uh, <clears throat> because he's got a plan and it doesn't fit their plan. Abuse of authority and empowering of a predator spirit. Now, if you want to see a predator ruler movie, I don't, we're going to look it up. What was the name of that movie? Ray Kroc. McDonald's, Lord have mercy, started with a teacher and a mercy, McDonald's. And uh, he came along and saw the plan, and he just devoured this idea, and he moved forward, and he just became a predator there. I'm, I, Lord, I don't want to speak ill of Ray Kroc. I don't know the man, and I don't know his heart. That's how the movie appeared to be, because... He was the founder. The founder. The founder. I don't really know his heart, and I don't know who he was or how he really was, but that movie portrayed a predator who comes in, takes it, gets a plan, but he, in the meantime, he devours others because he didn't have the mindset of a father, that redeemed ruler. Compromise of integrity to get it done. To get it done, move forward 80%. Nehemiah, because of his willingness to serve, he was trusted by the king as his cupbearer. People trust rulers because they feel safe. Rulers feel safe. They, he saw the task and knew how to get it done. He was not daunted in the face of problems. He formed a plan. He built with one tool in one hand and a weapon in the other. Safety. Rulers keep people safe. They feel safe. You want rulers. Worked with the people on the scene. His presence brought comfort, security. He, they knew he had his back. He rode his horse around the wall. He was constantly seen by the people. He was not off in an office somewhere making plans. He was with the people helping to build. And he was moving from place to place. Do you have everything you need? If you don't, we'll get it from over here. We're going to get a giver to work with him. And I'm telling you, they built a wall in phenomenal time. But he was also building in a social structure. He took care of the poor. He made sure the working conditions were good. He built a society. He built a culture while he was building a wall because he was building people into community. And they felt safe because he had a plan. Took the shofar blower with him to sound the alarm when the enemy came in from one side. He took wounded, broken people, networked and nurtured them to accomplish a supernatural task, building the wall. He completed his task, and he followed, fathered the nation of Israel while casting the vision. That is a ruler in their best way. This is my husband. He gets the job done. We've already talked about you, honey. Sorry, not always, not always 100%. He's safe. People feel safe when he's around. He brings up the rear on canoe trips, he built a strong network. <laughs> no concept of guilt. Just clean up the mess. Move on. Don't cry over spilt milk. Has learned to be a nurturer. He has learned 
that part because God has revealed his father heart to him so that he can now father. No welfare spirit. He takes people at their word. If you say you'll get, do this, he assumes you will do it because he would. Sometimes that's good and sometimes not. Always makes a plan and has an agenda. Stronghold. Loving projects and using people. That has been a, a motto in our home for way back when my children were little. We love people, we use projects, we use things, but we love people. But with a ruler builder, their stronghold is we got to just get it done. We just got to get this wall built. And not paying attention to those who are working with you, just get the job done. So that you end up devouring their time, devouring their assets because we've got a project and we just got to get it done. They can do that. Taking more than you give. Taking the resources for your project. But how much is your project going to give back? 80% is good enough. Let's move on to the next thing. I love Oral Roberts. We went, to, Bill Joe went to Oral Roberts University twice. I feel like I did too. I helped work to put him through. <laughs> I love that man. He's a man of integrity. And I honor him. And I just, I just have a love in my heart for him. But he was a ruler. He was a builder. He built a college. While we were there, what we saw was he built the city of faith, built a prayer tower, built a university. He had building plans all of the time. He was constantly new vision, new building, new vision, new building, millions of dollars. But when this building was about 80% finished he was ready to move on to build this so he starts casting a vision for this but this one's not finished so we began to see that we saw it I think the most heartbreaking was the city of faith because it was such an amazing vision and yet it got about 80 to 90 the building was built but his vision to be complete was spirit-filled doctors and nurses in that hospital when you entered the hospital, and it ran like this for a couple of years, when you entered the hospital, a prayer partner met you and stayed with you and would visit you two and three times a day. That was their job. They were hired to be your prayer partner throughout your illness. They were praying and anointing you for healing. The doctors and nurses were spirit-filled. They anointed. And we had a, a friend. Their daughter had to have surgery, and they anointed her. The doctor laid hands on her and prayed for her for surgery. Got in there. Oh, she didn't need surgery. She got healed because the doctor prayed. That was his vision. And he got the building built, but he didn't quite get there with the funding, and he moved over. That is heartbreak. That is heartbreak because the vision wasn't quite complete. But I still honor Mr. Roberts. I just I think he's a wonderful man. He was a father to that university while he was there. Builder, the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> The Ten Commandments. What is the standard of the Ten Commandments? 100%. That prophet perceiver sees that 100% standard. And that can be a real bone of contention between a ruler and a prophet perceiver because the ruler is satisfied with 80. But the prophet perceiver says, oh, no, there's a standard, and it's 100%. That's what was in the Ark of the Covenant, Aaron's rod, supernatural authority given by God to lead the people. His rod was the one that blossomed and bloomed. Golden pot of manna, the father heart of God and provision. Rulers do well with integrity Rulers do well with the supernatural authority to shepherd and lead. 
Here's the 80%. Releasing the father heart of God. You can feed and clothe the people. You can lead them. You can hold a high level of integrity. But unless you are fathering them, listening to them, praying with them, loving them, helping to build them, build in them the Father's heart, it's 80%. Not quite good enough. Be like Jesus. When you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But you know what? You can't show something you don't already own. Exhorter, you can't give hope unless you've been where you needed hope. And God gave it to you. And rulers... You cannot father unless you know the father face to face. The word intimacy is foreign to a ruler. The intimate heart of God. Jesus nurtured all the people around him, but he was always about the father's business. He knew the Father heart of provision, nurture, and supply. He released spiritual fathering to 12 men who would change the world. But he knew and accomplished the one thing he came to do was to redeem the world and bring his kingdom in the earth 100%. He set the platform when he nurtured people. He set the platform when he fathered 12 people. But that was not what he came to do. He came to redeem the world. He came to pay the sacrifice of the world. 100%. There's a deeper still for a ruler, too. I was praying about that this morning. And I just said, Lord, what's the deeper, percent, deeper still for a ruler? Where is it that you want to take them deeper? What does that look like? He said, go back to Nehemiah. Amazing man built a culture. But he was the king's cupbearer. He was very trusted by the king, and the king told him to come back home. So he did. But his heart longed for Jerusalem. He had a father heart for Jerusalem, and he wanted to go back. And when he went back, what he found broke his heart. It was a mess. There were people in the temple in the treasury that were stealing from the treasury. The poor was not being taken care of. The widows were not being taken care of. Predators had taken over the government of the city and were taking advantage of the people. The wall was built. The wall was still there. His project was done. There was disloyalty everywhere. Disloyalty. The driving force behind a ruler is to know you're loyal to me. And I'll take you anywhere. But there was no loyalty to be found. So Nehemiah, as a ruler, went deeper still. He took a deep breath and he started over even in the face of disloyalty, when the people didn't remember who he was, but they were being oppressed. And he started at the temple, and he cleaned out the temple, and he sent out the Shebnas and the, was it Tobias, and 
And he started over and he cleaned the temple first. And that's the word for the ruler to go deeper still. Clean the temple first. Examine yourself. Building a wall is not good enough. It is not enough to just build a wall. Start with your own heart. Look inside. Are there people that have been disloyal to me that I need to embrace and forgive and include? Are there people that I need to nurture that I haven't nurtured correctly? Are there things I need to rip out of my life? Are there things I need to bring into alignment? Do I need to go back to the Ark of the Covenant, 100% standard of the Ten Commandments? Am I nurturing the people with the rod of Aaron? Am I feeding and taking care of their needs? Start at the temple in the Ark of the Covenant. Look inside. Get this clean. Then the Father can fill you with his presence. You can understand his heartbeat, first of all, for you and how much he loves you, how precious you are to him. Let him nurture you so that then you can look out and nurture the people. Even in the face of disloyalty, even when it's all fallen apart and you're having to start all over again, you pick up the pieces and you move forward. That's what Jesus did. When he went to the cross, everything kind of fell apart. The disciples scattered. Where were these 12 men he had built? John was there and his mother was there. Peter had left. Judas betrayed. It all fell apart. So Jesus, walking to the cross as a champion, picked up the pieces in the face of disloyalty of his followers. And he finished 100%. You see, at the day, that day, the darkness was still there. All the demons in hell were there. Prince of darkness was there. But his loyal followers were gone. So in the face of disloyalty, our King Jesus looked further and saw Peter. He looked further and saw all his men. And he looked further and he saw you. And he saw every sin, every time you would be disloyal to him. He looked at every time you would deny his name. He looked at every time you chose the wrong way. He looked at every immoral act you've ever done. He faced every sin, every transgression that you personally would ever commit. Every demon in hell came up to his face and one by one by one they were defeated until the prince of darkness came up face to face, rattling the keys. I've still got the keys. Rattling the keys. And at that moment, the blood of Jesus began to pour from the cross and the enemy of your soul was defeated. And he said, no, 
100%, not 80% this time, 100% of the sin, 100% of the demons, and the prince of darkness himself was finished. And you were set free. He took those keys down at the temple. The Passover lamb was being slain. And the, as the priest cut the throat and as the blood began to pour on the altar, the priest shouted out because this lamb had been on display since through nine o'clock that morning, just like when Jesus had been put on display at the cross. And at three o'clock that afternoon, the, sl the slit in the lamb's neck poured the blood on the altar. And at that moment on Calvary, just outside the walls, the blood of Jesus was pouring on the altar of sin in front of the Father. And the priest shouted, it is finished. The price has been paid for one more year. But our champion shouted into the air, it is finished for eternity. The debt has been paid. You are set free. And it says he went into hell and he took the keys. He walked up to the enemy and said, I'll take those keys now. And the chains began to fall off and the prison doors opened and it said he led captives free because he finished the race. He won the battle. He conquered. He shouted the Hebrew word, Asa. Asa. I have to read what it says. The Hebrew word, Asa means to complete. It means to create. It means to bring to perfection. It means to make war. It means to avenge. And it means to conquer. So at that moment when he shouted, Asa, he said, I have come to make war. I have come to avenge. I have come to create and bring to perfection. Come forth, bride of Christ. You are paid for in full for all eternity. Our great ruler completed 100% bringing the Father heart and the anointing and the authority to give to rulers in the body of Christ to come and build his kingdom. They are the Joshua's and Caleb's. They're the fathers and mothers for this next generation. When they come to the table and they take the body of Jesus and they exchange it for that 80% and they pick up the anointing of his blood for the 100%. They have come to be leaders to father the generations. Aww. Ruler builders, fathers and mothers, show us the heart of the Father. That's your anointing. So we say, welcome rulers. Oh, how we need rulers at the table of the Lord. Bless you, rulers.